Hi everyone, welcome back to English 221. This is for our class for Wednesday, the 1st of March, where we are putting closure onto A Midsummer Night's Dream, moving forward to Much Ado About Nothing. So I hope that you are in the midst of reading Much Ado About Nothing, though we will also talk about performance. As you know, a journal was due on Midsummer Night's Dream, so I will be reviewing those journals and getting those back to you, much like I did with your first journal on sonnets. Today, what I wanted to do, though, was to talk about papers, specifically our upcoming paper, which isn't going to be until after we've put some conclusion to Much Ado About Nothing. So that'll be due on the 29th, which is a Wednesday at 11.59 p.m. via PDF to my email, much like I always ask for, ruiz, R-U-I-Z, at gcc.mass.edu. Now, the paper is different from the journal because it will be evaluated for grammar and mechanics as well as for content. And you will earn a letter grade on it. And that said, everybody has the option of rewriting the first paper if they so wanted to. So if it turns out that you are content with your grade, you're done. But if you would like to continue to work on the paper to earn a higher grade, you can take my comments into account. And assuming that you still need further direction, you can always make an appointment with me and then we could talk about it further. And you would do a revision and you would hand in both versions of the paper. Again, the revision along with the initial paper that was evaluated by me with my comments so I could compare and contrast the two. And you would earn the higher of the two grades, which is really the way that professional writers write because they go through a revision process. That said, um, the second paper will be due at the very ending of the semester, so I don't think there'll be time to do a revision. But I have had students in the past that have been able to submit in the second paper early enough so that they could negotiate with me, but negotiation is required. The first paper, everybody has the option of revising it. And you have up until the ending of the semester to hand in your revision, but the sooner the better for everybody involved. So in terms of thinking about paper number one, you can see the notes below that this is going to be a four to five page critical paper. So I'm not asking you to do any outside research. That said, if you have your heart set on writing a research paper, please let me know and we can negotiate. But part of the purposes of this class was to uh, teach you how to become familiar enough with Shakespeare so that you could have some understanding of the plays without needing to read a lot of outside viewpoints about what the play might mean. Now, if you were to refer to our syllabus and other documents folder, you'll see that I have a handout that I would have given you in class if we were meeting live entitled Suggested Paper Topics. And they are just that. They're merely suggestions because you can each decide on what to write your first paper about. In fact, there might be an idea in your journals that you could pursue for your first paper. But what I've done is I've given you just some very general ideas. And notice that I have not provided you with a thesis, a position that your paper would take. And that really is the hardest part of the paper is determining the thesis, what your point is going to be. And then you basically defend that point, a point that reasonable people could disagree with. But you defend it with a mixture of paraphrase and quotation from the text. Paraphrase being your own language, quotation being original or being the exact language from the text itself. But I wanted to read this handout to you just to give you an idea of some of the things you can contemplate with that first paper. And you'll notice that paper number one and paper number two are basically going to be the same exercise. So this assignment sheet works for both papers. Both are critical papers. In other words, you should not be consulting outside sources. But if you do want to write a research paper, as I had indicated, consult with me. Paper length is approximate four to five pages double space, one inch margins, but as long or as short as you think it needs to be in order to defend your thesis, something specific. And my assumption is that the first paper would be about the comedies, either Midsummer Night's Dream or Much Ado About Nothing. That said, the sonnets are a possibility, but understand that writing about a sonnet is a very different kind of exercise than writing about a drama. You can choose any of the topics that I've listed or 
you can write on your own topic because the topics that I'm giving you are merely suggestions. So feel free to adapt, combine, or dismiss. If you choose to write on your own topic, it's not a bad idea to briefly discuss the topic with me. And I hope you will all discuss your interests. And in terms of quotation and documentation, we will be using the MLA system, Modern Language Association system of documentation. I'm hopeful this is something that you had discussed in previous English classes, that this is the system that we use for the humanities, that includes English classes. But I also wanted to briefly review it with you as well. Basically, what the MLA system is about is using parentheses at the ending of the quotation. Whether the quotation finishes the sentence or not is irrelevant. But within those parentheses at the ending of the quote, then you've indicated um, information about where to locate that quote. Usually that's page number. Things are much easier with Shakespearean dramas because they are divided into act, scene, and line. So as you probably have noticed with some of my note-taking below the class videos, in the parentheses, I've indicated things like act two, scene one, line 37. All of those are divided up by um, periods. And basically, you can see that in the handout as well, that you begin with the act, and then you put a period, and then the scene, and then you put a period, and then the line number or numbers. And the syllabus will talk about some specific paper formatting specifications about how a paper should be typed and double-spaced in one-inch margins. It should have a separate cover page, which is basically just a separate sheet of paper that lists my name, your name, the due date, the class, um, also the paper title, which means that the paper should have a title, something that's unique to the paper itself. And as I have in the note for the paper topics handout, paper number one should address probably the comedies, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and or Much Ado About Nothing, though again, the sonnets might be an option. And paper number two, I would think, would address either the history, which is how we will spend the mid part of the semester, Richard II, or the tragedies, which is how we will end the semester with Macbeth and Othello. But not only are the sonnets a possibility, but I have an extra credit play at the very ending of the semester entitled The Tempest. It's a an uh, example of a tragic comedy, which I will talk a little bit about when we get a bit closer to that part of the semester. It's also thought to be Shakespeare's last play. We wouldn't have necessarily an entire class um, time to devote to it the way we have with the other plays, but I can at least briefly talk about the play. And if you wanted to earn a little bit of extra credit, you could submit in a journal for The Tempest or you could answer the final examination extra credit question on the Tempest, or you could do both. The final exam is going to be open book, open notes, and basically it's going to be a series of, of essay responses, and you get to choose within them. And that said, if you wanted to earn over 100 points, I will give you the possibility of earning up to 110 with a 10 point extra credit question um, for The Tempest. But we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more as the semester progresses. So in, in regards to your first paper, and these are also ideas you could pursue in a journal, you can talk about imagery. So you can isolate a central or a particularly meaningful imagery. Something like light dark imagery or animal imagery or food imagery and discuss one of the plays in terms of that image and what it discloses. Or perhaps you'd like to talk about character to examine one of the characters in one of the plays and his or her contributions to the play at large. Perhaps you wanted to examine some sort of theme in one of the plays such as revenge, suspicion, trust, death, love. As you know, the comedies, their central focus is on love, power, justice, etc. Perhaps you want to compare and contrast two things. I wouldn't compare and contrast two whole plays. That's really too broad of a topic for just four to five pages. That said, you could compare and contrast two characters, whether those two characters be within a play or whether those two characters be, let's say, um, within two different plays. So for instance, you could compare and contrast Helena and Hermia in A Midsummer Night's Dream. 
Or how about contrasting Hermia in A Midsummer Night's Dream and Beatrice in Much Ado About Nothing, which we will talk about. So that gives you a bit of focus. Or gender, to analyze one or two of the plays in terms of gender and power relationships. How does Shakespeare present the relationships between women and men, or women and women, and men and men in the world of the play? And then at the bottom, I have a quote, a good question to ask yourself when you're writing a paper or reading someone else's writing is, quote, have I or has the author said this as clearly, concisely, believably, or gracefully as possible, unquote. And you can see in the parentheses, I have Biddle, which is the author's last name, and the page number of that quote, nine, with my closed parentheses and then my ending punctuation. I understand this is a tall order to write clearly, concisely, believably, or gracefully. It's always a good idea to start early and to write in steps or stages rather than try to do it all in one chunk right before it's due. I had a very wise professor in college once say that a paper's never done. You just have to hand it in at some point. And I think that's true. We could spend years working on this paper, but obviously we don't have that kind of time. So I wanted to move on to talk a little bit about some of the conventions of writing a paper. And I, I'm hoping that this is review from your previous English classes. And this is also in the syllabus and other documents folder um, if you wanted to access it. And actually, this document entitled The Critical Paper was a document that was given to me when I was an undergraduate student many years ago, and I held on to it. And it still is one of the best that I've ever seen in terms of writing an academic paper. So in terms of the critical paper handout, it divides the stages of writing into planning and then writing and then finally, presentation. So the planning stage, and that is the most important stage probably, and it's the stage that most students tend to skip. The thinking stage, considering what it is you're going to write about. And the beauty of it is that you don't have to think about language. You can just think about ideas. And as the handout indicates, your job is to not analyze. That, that's a book report. That's something that you might do in a junior high school book um, summary. But to, um, you're not summarizing, you're, you're analyzing. Um, and analy analyzing is what you would do in an academic sem setting. Summarizing is what you do when you are trying to prove that you've read the text. But the assumption is that you've, of course, read the text. So basically, assume the reader's familiar with the text and you're, you're merely interpreting for the reader. Um, so avoid the temptation to retell the entire story. Just confine your comments on plot to subordinate clauses, emphasize in the main clause the significance of that action. Or in other words, what you want to do is devote the bulk of your sentences to analysis, not to summary. And you need to begin, as I had indicated, with the strong and specific thesis. And that is inserted in the first paragraph. That said, you may not necessarily know your thesis when you begin writing. You might need to actually discover your thesis as the paper continues. And then you can plug in the thesis after the fact into the opening paragraph. So you don't have to necessarily write chronologically. And you want to make sure that the thesis is comprehensive enough to be important, but not so general and bland as to be meaningless. So here are a couple of examples. Saying something like, in Hamlet, Shakespeare explores the complexities of experience really doesn't say anything at all because every piece of literature explores the complexities of experience. Or saying something like, Shakespeare employs much imagery in Hamlet, my response is, yeah, so what? Most authors do. The, the goal is to identify which imagery is used and why. So topic sentences, these should be the first sentences of each of your paragraphs. They should be founded upon ideas, not events. This should all support the thesis. So what you should be able to do is to read all of the topic sentences, which, because basically that topic sentence serves as a summary for the paragraph. And if you were to read just the topic sentences, you should get basically an outline of your paper. So this is a nice tactic when you are 
determining whether or not you're going off topic in your writing. Support all your points. Basically, my job is to take the opposite viewpoint. And your job, much like an attorney, is to gather the evidence together and to support your particular position. A good attorney can argue either side of the case, guilty or innocent, with the same evidence. It's a question of which evidence you choose. And of course, there might be more evidence on one side than another, but a skilled attorney is able to turn that evidence into something that's convincing, even if the evidence is somewhat weak. And that's the same thing that you would be doing with your own writing. Certainly, you can't fabricate evidence, but as long as there is a possibility based on the evidence that exists, then that would be enough um, for your writing. So support your argument with analysis, reference to the text, and some direct quotation where appropriate, but don't let the evidence take control of the paper. So I've seen two extremes, either students who don't quote and you need quotation, or the student who quotes everywhere because they really don't have enough content. So they're trying to lengthen the paper. Again, keep in mind that the page numbers are merely an estimate that the paper should be as long as it needs to be in order for you to support your particular thesis. So use the evidence that's necessary, but don't overdo it. Generally speaking, we want to avoid ending a paragraph in a quotation because we really usually want to comment on the relevance of the quote afterwards. And then the conclusion, which is usually the place where people are tired and they've said everything. So you want to save a little bit of energy and time for the conclusion. Don't just alter a few words from your opening paragraph. Keep in mind that your conclusion needs to be as developed as every paragraph. A paragraph is minimum three sentences long with a beginning, a middle, and end, but preferably much longer. So anything less than three sentences is not an academic paragraph. Um, one trick that oftentimes works if you're not quite sure how to end the paper is by relating the text to contemporary times. Not that you have to necessarily do that. You could also hint at a related idea or perhaps apply your thesis to another work by the same author. There are lots of ways you can do this. Or just reiterate what it was that you said in your introduction. But again, you want to make sure that the language isn't a repetition of what you've got in your introduction. So the next step is the writing. And the, the first principle of good writing is simplicity. The second is economy. So the idea is that you want to say as much as possible in as few words as possible. This is very difficult. I can tell you that this is my greatest challenge as an author, so we all have our challenges. What you should be able to do is have enough time left over so that you can go through each of your sentences independently and ask yourself with each sentence, can I rephrase the sentence in fewer words without sacrificing meaning? And if so, you probably should. I understand that that decreases the length of your paper. Better to have a shorter paper that's well written than a longer paper that's wordy. Length should come from new ideas, not from unnecessary language. So adjectives and adverbs, descriptive words, those are fine, but you don't want to overuse them. Again, to try to lengthen your paper because you don't have ideas. Active to the passive tense or active to the passive voice, that you want it to be very clear that the subject of the sentence is engaging in a particular action. The subject is who or what does the action. And each sentence has to have a subject and it has to have an action or a verb. So an active sentence would be something like Lillian graded the journals because Lillian is the subject of the sentence. Who or what did the grading was Lillian. And graded is the verb. And it's very clearly connected that the subject of the sentence was engaged in the grading. Lillian graded the journals. So that's active. And that's correct. A passive construction would be something like the journals were graded by Lillian. It's as if the grading were happening to me. But even worse, if you were to think about word count, it's a longer construction when you are writing in the passive voice. Lillian graded the journals four words. The journals were graded by Lillian six words. And again, you go to the rule that you read each sentence and if there's a way you can rephrase so that you are reducing language, do it. Vary your sentences. You should have a mix of long and short sentences. Too many long sentences, the paper's too 
too dense. Too many short sentences, the paper's too choppy. And you want to also vary your sentence beginnings. You don't want multiple sentences um, in a row beginning in the same way. And keep in mind, again, some random notes. You want to avoid things like cliches, overused expressions. In fact, Shakespeare created some of those cliches. Um, but that said, when he wrote them, they were original. So when we were talking about the course of true love never did run smooth is indeed a cliche or a trite expression. And at the time that Shakespeare wrote it, it was original. But of course now, much like jealousy is that green-eyed monster, which we will talk about when we get to Othello and, and lots of other um, language as well. So people are quoting Shakespeare all the time and may not necessarily even be aware of it. So that said, you want to use your own language rather than using a, a cliche or rather than using slang. Um, slang is just informal language that usually has a, an, an understanding with a particular group of people. Sometimes slang goes mainstream and large groups of people will know the meaning. But slang is something that usually is created to exclude others from meaning. Um, it's what adolescents do every generation, though sometimes their slang goes mainstream. When I say something like someone is a cool person, I'm not talking about their temperature. I'm talking about their temperament. And that might not necessarily be obvious to someone who's learning English as a second or a third language. This is one of the reasons why we want to try to avoid slang because of a greater possibility of misinterpretation. Or even an expression like, um, it's raining cats and dogs. What do cats and dogs have to do with rain? And, and why do cats have to go before dogs? And in a lot of ways, it's quite nonsensical. So instead of saying something like that, saying that it's raining heavily. Again, these are very formal rules, but these are the rules that are expected in academia and also in the workplace. So you can never go wrong by being a bit formal. In fact, in, in terms of my education, it, it was so formal that we were encouraged to avoid contractions where you take two words like do and not and you contract them and you make them into one word such as don't or can't or won't, which is something that we do all the time in our language when we're speaking, but to try to avoid that in our writing. Do not, cannot, will not, so that you want to be a little bit more formal. And... That said, I always tell a story about why it is that we talk about having some set of standardization when it comes to language, because there is a greater possibility of misunderstanding if we don't have a set of rules for standardization. And it, this is a real story, unfortunately. It happened several decades ago. And basically, it was about a student who was going to a party. And the student was a second language English student. And he ended up going to the wrong house, unfortunately, a house that had been burglarized um, previously. So the owner of the house, shall we say, was quite anxious. The student knocked on the door. The owner opened the door. The student asked if this is where the party was. And the owner responded with a slang term that I suspect you already know freeze, which means to stop or halt. But for whatever reason, the student misheard or misunderstood. He continued forward. And the response of the homeowner was to pull out his gun, which he always wore, and to shoot that student dead on his doorstep. True story, unfortunately. Illustrating how misunderstanding can actually lead to a life and death situation. And I always use this as an example of why it is that we try to have some element of standardization with language because there is just a greater possibility of misunderstanding. So avoiding things like slang and, and trite expressions and avoiding things such as um, cliches. Um, it's always better to be a little bit more conservative than a little bit less conservative. Maintain the present tense. I know this is going to be very difficult and that these works were written in the past and you read them in the past, but the convention when we're talking about literature is to talk about them in the present as if they were happening now. 
rather than to talk about them in the past. So it wasn't that, that let's say, a Titania said to Oberon. It's that Titania says to Oberon, as if it's happening now. Helps to make the piece of literature timeless and universal. And then the last piece, the, the presentation piece or the editing piece where you want to make sure that you're proofreading carefully and avoid mistakes in previous papers. A good tip might be to read backwards. So to start with the last page of the paper, work your way forward. Obviously, the paper won't make sense. That's the whole point. So that you can concentrate on the sentences rather than on the whole and see if there are mechanical errors there. Each sentence is an independent unit. It should be able to stand on its own, uh, make sense on its own. Your title, again, should be something that is original and reflects your thesis. So if you're writing about A Midsummer Night's Dream, don't call your paper A Midsummer Night's Dream. Somebody's already chosen that title. His name is Shakespeare. That said, you can embed Shakespeare's title into your own title. So you could call your paper Love in Midsummer Night's Dream. The convention is that we underline or put in italics um, novels or dramas or works that can stand on their own. And short stories, their titles are put in quotation marks. Only if these things have been published, not if they have not been published. So that means your title does not need to be italicized or underlined or put in quotation marks. Though if you are referencing the drama within your title, or the title of the drama within your title, then you would need to italicize it or to underline it, but not the title in its entirety. And you don't need to bold your title or to put it in a larger font. You do want to make sure in your opening paragraph where you have your thesis, you also have the name of the author and the work that you are discussing. Um, to illustrate how old this handout is, it says instructors prefer typewritten papers. The paper must be typed, double space, one inch margins. Um, if you are handing in a physical copy, you would not submit a bulky folder and you would use a staple. But obviously, since this is an online class, you are submitting it via PDF to my email, much like you do with your journals. And the paper is due on time on the date assigned. So if you need an extension, please ask me ahead of time. So those are just some of the conventions that I wanted you to consider. And documentation examples, as I had indicated, quoting from Shakespeare is actually easier rather than more difficult because the plays are, devote, are divided into act, scene, and line. So you can see the notes below in section three, I have some documentation examples. So you don't need to necessarily use parenthetical documentation if you're just quoting a word or two. For instance, Hamlet speaks of himself as a quote, dull and muddy meddled rascal, unquote, a, quote, coward, unquote, a, quote, villain, unquote, and in, quote, ass, unquote. However, if you were to have a longer piece, then in the parentheses, you want the act, you want the scene, and you want the line. And the example in the handout is that Hamlet imagines the world, or actually, this is not in the handout, this is in the notes below the video. Hamlet imagines the world as, quote, an unweeded garden slash that grows to seed, unquote. And then open parentheses, one, period, and then lowercase two, period, and then 135-36. That means act one, scene two, on 135 to 36. The slash indicates a break in the line of poetry, because as we know, Shakespeare oftentimes writes in poetry. Or another example Hamlet's conception of the world reveals itself early in the first soliloquy. Quote, "'Tis an unweeded garden slash that grows to seed." Unquote. And that's in Act 1, Scene 2, line 135 through, one, through 136. Notice that the closing a punctuation comes after the parenthetical documentation. Now, if you have a long quote, generally that's over three lines long, then what you would do is block it off. You can see an example of this in the example with Hamlet begins his first soliloquy with the wish for self-destruction. Oh, that this too sullied flesh would melt, thaw and resolve itself into a dew, or that the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. 
and we've got four lines there. You can see that basically you're just duplicating the length of the line that would appear in the drama itself. That's how you are blocking it off. In a block quote, you do not need quotation marks. That would be considered redundant. But in a block quote, you have punctuation first and then parenthetical documentation, which in this case is Act 1, Scene 2, Line 129 to 132. If you were to leave out something, we use an ellipsis. Those are three periods in a row. If you were to leave out a word or several words, if you were to leave out an entire line, you could even do an entire line of dots, much like in the example below. Hamlet reflects upon the temptation to destroy himself as when he wonders, who would bear the whips and scorns of time? And then we have that line of periods indicating that a line or several lines have been deleted. When he himself might as quiet as make with the bare bodkin. And that is Act 3, Scene 1, 69, comma, 74 through 5. So that means the first line is line 69, and then we've skipped to line 74, going to line 75. So when you think about quoting, you're using the same conventions, whether you're using an ellipsis or square bracket. You use a square bracket if you're inserting yourself, your own language into a quotation. We try to avoid that unless it's absolutely necessary. Usually it's done to clarify something in a quote, certainly not the comment on the relevance of the quote. Um, something like a pronoun, so it might be unclear which character you're talking about. If you're using the pronoun he, um, and based on the quote that you selected, it could be either Lysander or Demetrius. So if you wanted to, in a square bracket, after the pronoun he, you could add in the word Lysander. That's your language, not Shakespeare's. But you're clarifying for the reader that the he is in reference to Lysander in this instance, which would be clear in the whole of the play, but based on the selection that you chose, it may not necessarily be clear. And of course, if you are quoting Shakespeare and you aren't quoting poetry, then you would quote the way you would quote any piece of prose or complete sentences. So the example we're given is, world weariness overtakes Hamlet's and his remarks to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Quote, I have of late, but somewhere I know not, lost all my mirth, foregone all custom of exercises. And indeed, it goes so heavily with my disposition that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile, promontory. And notice that's Act 2, Scene 2, Line 295 to 299. And throughout that quote, we see a couple of ellipses, which means that a word or several words have been omitted. Um, you use the ellipsis when you are omitting something from the middle of a passage, from the point from where you've decided to begin your quote and where you've decided to end your quote. Because you can decide where to start it, the quote, you could decide where to end the quote. So you don't need an ellipsis at the beginning or the ending of the quote. Only between those two points of beginning and end, if you leave something else, then you would use an ellipsis. So I, I hope this is review. I understand that for some of you, this may not be review. So if it, it turns out that I was going too quickly or if you have any questions, please let me know. Though keep in mind that everybody has the option of rewriting their first paper. And if it was something that you already knew very well, I hope this wasn't too dry for you, that this was a, a useful um, reminder of some of the elements to consider when you are writing. The next class is when we start to get into much ado about nothing and, and get to talk about that play. But for today's attendance question, which would be due on Friday the 3rd at 8 a.m. on our discussion forum, and again, if you need additional time, please let me know. I thought I would ask about paper number one. What do you think? will be your greatest challenge writing paper number one and why? What do you think your greatest challenge will be and why? Again, you're not required to respond to your classmates, but you are required to read your classmates' responses. Certainly you can respond to your classmates if the mood hits you, much like you would respond in class by raising your hand. 
and I will respond to all of you and you should read those responses as well. So in closing, I hope you're doing well. I'm doing well and we will continue our next class with our second comedy. Much Ado About Nothing. Take care. Bye-bye.